from Arnold Block Libra's clients and from colleagues in the law and across the Australian business community. Arnold Block Liebler and Herzog Fox have a very long standing and special relationship. In fact, uh, Gil and I were meant to be uh, uh, meeting uh, a few days after October 7. I was in Israel uh, celebrating Sukkot uh, before uh, uh, the hostilities uh, broke out, but uh, we uh, we've just planned to uh, to reconnect in the very in the very near future and i want to take this opportunity to convey to our good friends at herzog fox and to all israelis that arnold bloch liebler our partners clients colleagues and friends stand with the people of israel during these difficult times and that we will continue to do so in the future we know the battle israel is fighting is one for all of us not just for the Jewish community, but for Western civilization. And before handing over to Herzog Fox's managing partner, Gil White, to provide some real time context to this evening's briefing, I should let people know that Daniel and Orly have indicated that they are happy to take questions at the end of their briefing. Please submit your questions via the Q&A button and we'll try to get through as many as time permits. Over to you, Gil, thank you. Thank you, Henry. Uh, good morning from the Holy Land. Good evening, good afternoon um, to those of you in Australia. Thank you for having taken the time to be with us. Um, as I said to Henry before we jumped on, on the Zoom with everybody, um, we're seeing the activities and the support coming out, led by our dear friends, we feel like family, uh, Arnold Bloch Liebler, but also the wider legal and Jewish and non-Jewish communities in Australia. Um, when the front page of the Australian is shown on every news channel in Israel, you should realize that at what is a very difficult time in our country, these efforts you're making in your own country are something which are appreciated uh, more than you know by those of us in Israel. So we find ourselves in a position, I think none of us from Israel on this call thought we would be on and that is we are in a country at war. From since the 7th of October, the atrocities committed by the Hamas ter terrorists, the country went immediately onto a war footing. We have 96 employees, 13 of whom are partners who have been called up for reserve duty. Um, the vast majority of those are at the front line. Everything about this war is personal. 15 employees in our office, lost immediate family members, two lost sisters, one lost a brother. We had in the first week, one of our lawyers from the real estate department who was injured from a missile sent from Hezbollah on the border of Lebanon. As he was lying injured, a team came to rescue them and call a helicopter to helicopter the injured to hospital. Shows you what a small country, but the rescue team was led by another member of the same department in our office. All of us have loved ones at the front. I have a son sitting in a field 500 metres from the border of Lebanon, a daughter who is in one of the biggest army bases in the south of Israel on the border of Gaza, an army base which was overrun by Hamas on the 7th of October. Thankfully, my daughter was asleep in her bed. The purpose of this seminar is not necessarily to show you that which you have seen before, but really to give you a view as to where we are now. We had a pause, as President Biden put it, in the hostilities for a week where we had the most emotional, moving pictures of children and women taken hostage in the tunnels of Gaza. We still have 136 Israeli and Thai citizens. The Thai nationals who are hostages in the tunnels of Gaza came to work in Israel. They're as much a part of Israel as those who hold Israeli passports. And we still have the relative of one of our employees being held hostage in Gaza. I want to thank you all again. Thank you to Henry and the whole team at Arnold Bloch Liebler. There is only one message which I said to Henry back, I think, on the 8th of October, which I will repeat today. Um, we are fighting a war which is not an independence war. The state of Israel 
is an extremely strong, vibrant, liberal, modern country. We will overcome this war. We will overcome other wars if they are started around us. Um, there are two positive elements on here. I will stop and pass over to my partners, which have come out of these atrocities. One is the unity within Israel. The second is the unity between the diaspora and Israel. If we know how to leverage those two real rays of sunshine in the months and years ahead, something positive will have come out of a really, really, really dark period. Thank you all again very much indeed for joining us. And good afternoon to everyone. Uh, my name is Daniel Reisner, and I head the International Law, International Trade, and National Security Department at Herzog. And I will be taking you through uh, the part of the presentation where we discuss what happened, what is happening, and and start the discussion of also the legal implications of, of everything. Uh, as a quick word of background, I have had uh, before I became a private lawyer, and I've been working at Herzog now for 15 years, uh, my first career was military. I spent 20 years uh, in the military. For 10 of those years, I was the head of the international law department of the IDF. And another 20 years, I spent as the Israeli government's uh, uh, chief lawyer and negotiator for the peace process, which you can probably agree with me is a bit ironic in these days, but given the fact that the Treaty of Peace with Jordan, which I was one of the negotiators and drafters of, is still surviving, then there are additional rays of hope in spite of all the things that are happening in our neighborhood. What we thought would be useful for me to start is to give you a five-minute introduction of how did we get into this mess, specifically with respect to Gaza. So let me take you back in time to uh, a period of 400 years which lasted until 1917, when the Ottoman Empire, which you can see here in green, uh, occupied most of our region of the planet. And this is important because at the end of World War I, when the Ottoman Empire lost, the territories in our region, which had belonged to it, were divided between the two victors, uh, England and France. And England is in the light purple and France is in the orange. And those were the territories that these two countries held uh, for about 20 years. Toward the end of the Second World War, both of these colonizing powers decided that they didn't have the bandwidth to control this part of the world. And as a result, uh, they started giving the, the, the locals independence. This process started in Egypt in 1922. In 1932, both Iraq and Saudi Arabia were given independence from England to be followed by Lebanon, a newly minted country which had never existed before, which was established by the French in 1943. Three years later, the French established Syria and the British established Jordan. And finally, two years later, Israel declares independence. Uh, now, Theoretically, when you look at this map, you will say all of the Middle East were therefore divided into these new states, but that is not totally accurate, because as this map will show you, the two plots of land in light blue, the West Bank and the Gaza Strip, were left out of this uh, uh, new state forming process. And the reason for this was that in these areas lived people who had no strong relationships with any of the Arab states, and therefore the Arab states did not view them as part of them. And when we established independence, we didn't view them as part of us either. So whether they were left in limbo. Um, now, I want to focus on that little uh, 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 shape towards the south of Israel, which is the Gaza Strip, because I want to explain who controlled it, or who has controlled it until now. So from 1948, for a period of almost uh, uh, 20 years, 19 years actually, the Egyptian military controlled Gaza, but as I said, they never declared it part of Egypt nor annexed it, they left it under military occupation. Uh, and we took it off the hands in 1967, and we controlled the Gaza Strip until 2005, when you will remember that uh, Prime Minister Ariel Sharon 
decided to complete the process of unilaterally withdrawing from Gaza and transferring all of it to the Palestinian Authority, which we had established jointly in the Oslo peace process. Unfortunately, uh, the Palestinian Authority was very weak and in the eyes of most Palestinians, extremely corrupt. And therefore, the following year, it lost the elections for the Palestinian parliament to Hamas, which within 12 months had decided to take armed control of Gaza by actively ousting and killing all of the Palestinian Authority people. And Hamas has remained in power in Gaza since 2006. Now, an introduction to Hamas, because they are the main character in our current very uh, sad play, we're talking about a, a Islamic militant movement established in 1987. Uh, uh, um, they have been declared as terrorist organizations in most of the Western world, in the US first, in the EU more recently, and in Australia, as you can see the dates, relatively recently, all of Hamas was recognized as a terrorist organization because previously many countries had decided to go halfway and just declare the military arm of Hamas as a terrorist organization. But this process has more or less ended and now most of the Western world recognizes the entire organization as a terrorist organization. As I said, they took over the Gaza Strip in 06 after winning the elections. And of course, there have been no elections since they took power because they, of course, are not democratic in nature. And to put them in context of fighting, uh, according to their claim, they have about 40,000 fighters uh, uh, of different levels of expertise, and they manufacture a lot of their own uh, 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 weapon systems. But their primary funding comes from Iran, which the estimate is just over 300, 350 million US dollars annually, together with another really important country in our region, which is Qatar. Now, just so that everyone is on the same page of what uh, Hamas would like happen, this is a quote from the Hamas Covenant. It's available on their website, no need. And generally it says that there's no solution except if we kill all the Jews and destroy the state of Israel, and that's the credo. Which leads us to October 7th, 2023. I will assume for the purpose of this discussion that all of you are very familiar with what happened. So this will be a really quick overview and there will be no grisly pictures or videos. I will say, by the way, that for those of you who really want to see what happened, uh, there is a website called Hamas.com where the atrocities are actually, the videos are available now online. I do not recommend watching it because I watched a few of them and I don't think it's good for anyone's soul, but for people who really want to know, that is a possibility. Um, this is the Gaza Strip and the area in light purple are the, is the area which was attacked on October 7th. And this was a physical attack. And this is a small slide showing the different locations in which people were attacked on October 7th. However, all of this was done under the cover of a huge uh, rocket and missile attack. You can see the number just on October 7th, they fired over 4,300 rockets into Israel. I can't tell you how, how much that is, but trust us, it's a lot. Uh, um, and the results were shocking. They were shocking to us and they were shocking to them because they broke our defensive line, which was incredibly weak. And we'll get to deal with that negligence after the war. And they managed to enter unmolested into numerous towns and villages with huge impact. And these are just some of the pictures of the villages after the attack. And again, these are the nice pictures because there's no people in them. Uh, um, there was a uh, music festival just next to the Gaza border uh, and around 360 participants of that uh, uh, festival were murdered by Hamas. Uh, they were shot, they were rounded up, and they were shot en masse. Um, in addition to killing people, they took over 240 hostages. These are just some of the pictures. Oh, by the way, Hamas came into the operation with GoPro cameras. So uh, lots of this stuff was filmed. And remember the picture on the left of the mother with the two red-headed 
maybe we'll get to them in a minute as well. Um, and this is the aftermath in some of the villages. And again, uh, silent pictures, which show you the devastation. And the, the scenes were so horrific that, that even the first responders and the soldiers found it extremely difficult to, to, to go to those locations and to see what, what's going on there. This is just one example of the results. And putting it in numbers, around 1,200 people were murdered on October 7th. Of them, over 1,000 were civilians, and uh, which include women, children, the elderly, foreign citizens. And let me just make it clear, they weren't just murdered. They were brutally murdered. And, and the stories of what was done to them are now coming out. But, but uh, let's just say that if you want to sleep for the rest of your life, stay away. Um, and from the perspective of Israel, this is the highest number of Jewish people murdered in a single day since the Holocaust. So Nazi Germany would be proud of Hamas. Uh, in addition to the dead, of course, we have over 5,000 wounded. We had 236 hostages and 32 missing. The numbers keep changing as we identify the remains of additional people. So I'll get to the updated numbers in a minute. And just to put things in perspective, this was especially poignant for the, our American friends. Uh, we all remember the tragic events of 9-11 from a comparative perspective, meaning uh, population sizes compared. October 7th was 13 and a half times the size of October 11th from the Israeli perspective. So uh, everyone knows someone who was killed, murdered, abducted, etc. And just to highlight another relatively un untalked about aspect of the war is as a result of what happened in the South and what is continuing to happen in the North, we now have approximately a quarter of a million re Israeli refugees inside Israel. People who are away from their homes, staying in hotels and temporary lodging, because they can't go back because people are trying to kill them right now or they have no homes to go back. However, I do need to put things in a bit of a wider perspective and you do remember my background. So what really happened on October 7th? Well, what really happened was this country and this country is Iran. And just to, uh, to make things clear, Iran probably didn't order the specific attack on October 7th, but to the best of our understanding, Iran was extremely concerned about the uh, 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 rising possibility of a peace agreement between Israel and Saudi Arabia, and apparently gave the green light to all of its proxy armies, which are situated in these locations, to start escalating to try to derail that process. And these proxy armies, the names you can see here, so you have Hamas and Palestinian Islamic Jihad in Gaza, and you have Hezbollah in Lebanon, but you have organizations in Syria, Iraq, and Yemen. And as you've seen, Yemen has been trying to fire, the Houthis in Yemen have been trying to destroy Israeli shipping and fire missiles and UAVs at Eilat. So Iran has got everyone involved. And just so that you just don't take my word for it, this is a picture of Hamas leadership sitting with the Iranian leadership just before the attack. And this is a New York, uh, uh, a Wall Street Journal article explaining that just before the attack, about 500 Palestinian Hamas activists were actually trained for the attack in Tehran. So what happened since October 7th? Uh, of course, we started counting the hostages. Uh, uh, we buried the dead and we enlisted the army. And as Gil said, in our firm, approximately 15 or 17 percent of our personnel were enlisted. And this across the board is, is, is the same all, all over Israel. But another thing which Gil mentioned happened is Israeli so, uh, uh, civil society stood uh, stepped up where the government was totally ineffective, civil society fell in. And I can tell you that we have never seen the level of, of, um, uh, of, of, of support and volunteering that we're seeing today in Israel. Everything from uh, military equipment up to uh, 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 food and, and support for the families dislocated, etc. This level of support also found itself uh, in the political sphere when 
a lot of our friends came to show their support. Uh, the Americans, as opposed to everyone else, also showed us their support by sending two aircraft carrier groups and actually threatening Iran that if they try to escalate the process, especially in the north, the U.S. military will get involved. We established a coalition government and we launched our attack. And here you can see the route of the Israeli entry into Gaza. But here I want to stress a point which we'll get to in a few minutes. Uh, even when we did that, uh, we started showering Gaza Strip with leaflets, warning them in advance of where we would be coming, which of course in wartime you do understand is not necessarily common behavior, so that the civilian population could get out of the way. And more about that a bit later. Um, Hamas has been trying to escalate the West Bank, and there have been numerous uh, terrorist attacks in the West Bank in parallel to what's going on Gaza. And they started sending out videos of hostages trying to use psychological warfare to convince us to do something. I don't even know what. On the one hand, we saw a lot of support internationally for the hostages and for Israel, and there were rallies all over the world. But we also saw an unprecedented rise in anti-Semitism, which I, I'm sure our Australian friends are feeling on a daily basis. And even some of our clients, this is a, a, a picture from Amazon UK, uh, started selling from the river to the sea uh, uh, T-shirts. Thankfully, they took them down after they realized what was going on. One of the previous webinars included the general counsel of Amazon UK. So I gave him kudos for taking it off. Um, we had an incident in a country called Dajastan when a mob tried to storm an, an uh, airplane which just arrived from Israel to try to lynch all the people on the plane. And another uh, a ray of sunshine, as Gil puts it, uh, most of the leading U.S. law firms sent a letter to uh, 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 the leading U.S. universities, which have witnessed incredible scenes of anti-Semitism, warning them that if uh, the, these scenes are not stopped, then they will have to reconsider their relationship with these universities with respect to hiring and future work. So we're seeing the world more or less divided between the supporters of Israel and the anti-Semites who are coming out of the woodwork. But there's another phenomenon which will definitely not come as a surprise to you. This is, we are in the age of fake news. So just a few examples so that you can see. This is a picture of, 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 a, of a swing, which of course was portrayed as part of, of, of the results of the IDF attacks in Gaza. In reality, it's a swing in Syria, which was published on the web four years ago. Um, this is a picture of a Palestinian boy who was apparently killed by the IDF, uh, 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 except this comes from, a, I believe, an Indian movie. Uh, 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 this girl, again, portrayed as a victim, is actually from another movie scene. Uh, um, uh, this girl, by the way, it's not a movie scene, but we've seen her in three different pictures, in three different locations. They didn't even change her pajamas, but they changed the people holding her for, in each, every location. Um, this is probably the best one of them all. This is a picture, a very... Can you please count the numbers of fingers on the upraised hand and realize what you're looking at. Um, so the, the period of fake news has come here as well. And a lot of the stories coming out of Gaza are questionable at best. We don't know exactly what is going in on in Gaza because Hamas does not allow any non-Palestinian press to enter and to show what's really happening. We had a ceasefire deal, which lasted for about a week, started on November 24th included the cessation of hostilities that lasted until the 28th when Hamas started firing again, included an agreement on exchange of Israeli hostages. I need to explain something. They didn't give them away freely. The deal was that for each uh, hostage, we would release three convicted or detained terrorists from our jails. And in addition, we would stop all military overflights of Gaza so that they could move without being seen and prepare for the continuation. 
It also included an agreement that the Red Cross would visit the remaining hostages, which Hamas never allowed. And on our side, we agreed to allow uh, uh, significant numbers of aid, uh, humanitarian aid, to enter Gaza. Um, hostages were released in carefully staged events where they were seen waving to the captives until they got to the Israeli hands as they started telling what really happened to them. Um, there were a lot of really emotional scenes in Israel when the hostages came back home. Um, uh, uh, and in return, we let humanitarian aid in, as I said. Just a, a word of warning, uh, on average, the people coming back from, from being hostages for 50 plus days uh, lost between 15 and 20 percent of the body weight because apparently food was not an option. Uh, uh, and, and that's for the people who were not otherwise abused. I'm just talking about the starvation aspect. Um, however, fighting has renewed. And on December 1st, Hamas at 5.42 a.m., uh, uh, Hamas launched rockets into Israel again. So throughout the ceasefire, we managed to get back 106 hostages. 80 of them Israeli women and children, the remainder primarily foreign citizens. Um, and that means that 141 men, women, and children are still being held hostage in Gaza. Of these, 130 are Israeli citizens and 11 are Thai that we know of. Um, we also know that apparently some of the hostages are dead, but we don't know exactly who. Uh, you remember the woman with her two small babies, the Bibas family? Uh, 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 Hamas has said that they are all dead, although we have video footage of them being taken to Gaza. Um, and the U.S. State Department just yesterday said that one of the reasons Hamas does not want to release the remaining hostages is because they don't want people to know what happened to them while in captivity. Uh, and this is the U.S. government position. So because many of us are lawyers, I want to say a few words about the legal aspects of the war. Uh, uh, first of all, as background comments, the war itself is governed by international law and the laws of war, right, which is one of the oldest chapters in international law. And for those of you who are not experts in international law, uh, uh, international law, the laws of war, they purport to balance between military needs on the one hand and humanity on the other. Um, and one of the basic tenets of international law, which is becoming really difficult is that international doesn't give you an, an out even if the other side totally disregards it. In other words, even if the other side violates international law from day one, it doesn't mean that you are exempt from complying. Now, as I told you, I used to be the head of international law for the Israeli army. My job was to make sure that the army was fighting lawfully. Today, my successors, successors, successors are doing this 24 seven a day, uh, uh, there are dozens, if not uh, over 100 lawyers actually involved in that every single second. But I can tell you it is extraordinarily difficult to comply with the laws of war when the other side intentionally put civilians in the line of fire, hide the military bases under schools, mosques, and hospitals, and does other things which at the end of the day makes uh, civilian casualties inevitable. And if we just take a quick look at Hamas's actions, obviously everything they did was a crime, was a war crime. Uh, they reached the level of crime against humanity and the events of October 7 definitely even read the level of uh, genocide. And of course, I can guarantee that there will be criminal proceedings against Hamas and its leaders and its supporters in numerous uh, countries and jurisdictions, including the International Criminal Court. But Hamas doesn't care. And they don't care because, uh, we, except for the representatives abroad, uh, uh, um, uh, Hamas has already been designated as a terrorist organization with no real impact, and they just don't travel to the West, so they don't care at all. With respect to Israel's response, uh, we are committed to continue to abide by the laws of war, in spite of the fact that Hamas is violating and doing everything in its power to place civilians in the line of fire. And the primary issues, I'm just going to name them, which arise here in international law, are the right of self-defense, which obviously was triggered on October 7th, the principle of distinction, 
where Israel is bound to target only military targets and not civilian targets. The principle of proportionality, where you need to ensure that when you target a military target, you're not going to inadvertently harm an, an, an exaggerated amount of civilians. And similarly, that you must take precautions in attack uh, when launching uh, such attacks in order to minimize uh, uh, civilian harm. And of course, provide humanitarian assistance to the civilian population where possible. So Israel is doing its best to comply with all of these rules. And in fact, the US State Department yesterday just came out with a article, was it this morning, saying that uh, on their review currently, they think Israel is complying with the laws of war. Uh, but it isn't easy, especially when you are commander in the field and someone is shooting at you with an RPG from a, from a residential building, a applying the laws of war in reality is a bit more complicated than just sitting in a law office and giving legal advice. And finally, let's talk about Israel during the war and what we're doing. And in a moment, I'm going to hand you over to my partner, Oli, who will give us a deeper dive into the employment aspect. But for the first two weeks, we were in shock. I mean, nothing like this has ever happened to us. And of course, the country just shut down. And the result was, of course, that everyone said, oh, the Israeli economy is going to slump, blah, blah, et cetera. However, in spite of repeated rocket attacks, restaurants opened, stores opened, and people started going back to the daily lives. And in fact, the shekel started strengthening again, and we started doing business again. And people went back to work. And I have to tell you that currently we are as busy today as we were, I think, before the war, at least I, my department, I think all his department in this respect. And we are seeing investment rounds and we are seeing fundraising and we are seeing acquisitions and we are seeing everything. So we have come up with a new wartime normal for the Israeli economy, which was actually surprising to us. And a few words about the legal aspects. Israel has three emergency declarations in force today. The first, and the first we've ever done in the last 50 years, is we formally declared ourselves in a state of war. We didn't say who the war is against, just similar to the US in 9-11. But this declaration has primarily international law and Israeli constitutional law effect, but as I said, there is no defined enemy. The more important declaration is a, dec a declaration called a special situation in the home front, which Oli will talk a bit more about in a second. This has been declared several times in the past, but never on this scope, and it empowered the military to issue protective instruction to the populace, but more importantly, it triggers numerous uh, 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 other laws and powers, which Oli will talk about in a second. And thirdly, since 1948, we have also had the state of emergency, which empowered the government to issue emergency legislation without going through parliament. This power was used quite extensively during COVID, and the government is doing a lot of work on this itself now. And we're seeing new emergency legislation every week, uh, uh, which is good on the one hand, because it means that the government can react quickly to necessity, it's bad because this doesn't go through any parliamentary approval process. And that leads me to uh, hand things over to my colleague, friend, and partner, uh, uh, Oli Jerby, who will discuss some of the issues related to war in the workplace. Oli, over to you. Hi, everyone. Good afternoon. So thank you so much for joining us. Um, I would like to divide uh, my... Uh, my, my brief presentation into two uh, major parts. One is uh, how do we deal with the business continuity need, needs? Like Daniel said, we are working, we would like to work, the economy is uh, very important uh, also in this circumstance and maybe in particular in the circumstances. So we have the business continuity issues, but on the other hand, unfortunately, there are some fields and industry that badly uh, badly uh, injured and they need um, some uh, uh, legal advice and support with respect to the crisis that they are facing. So um, let's let's talk about the, all these topics uh, very briefly. It would give you some kind of flavor of what is it that we are dealing with. So first of all, with respect to uh, 
business continuity. So Daniel mentioned that there is a declaration of special situation in the home front. This triggers two uh, important uh, laws. What is the protection of employees during uh, during a emergency situation? And the other is relates to essential enterprises in which certain specific flexibility of uh, operating is at place. So the business continuity, what did we face? First of all, you know, we have a work and uh, rest, uh, a work and rest law, like you know, some balance between work and rest hours. So here we, uh, the government issued, the Ministry of Labor issued a special uh, permit in which allows to work uh, um, in longer hours, longer days, longer weeks uh, in this regard. Um, and, you know, much more than the limitations that we have during a ongoing, uh, during the real reality, during the ongoing life. So first of all, this this gave uh, a lot of uh, um, uh, flexibility to workplace in this regard. Secondly, there were a, they they were issued the the government issued special permit with respect to foreign employees. Uh, everyone who had um, a valid permit, a valid permit uh, to work, could continue to work without the need of extending it. It gave some air you know, to many industries. It was first general and now it became more specific, but the flexibility here was much, was very, was very important uh, as well. Also, uh, as I said, there are some rules with respect to um, essential uh, enterprises. It covers a lot of industries from cyber to water, to energy, communication, uh, security, of course, uh, food, anything that you can think of in terms of essential uh, industries to this situation. And the law that came into effect that, that had been triggered due to the declaration uh, are inclusive of um, permits uh, to call, to force employees to come to work as if they are a, a, a call to the army. Um, Thankfully, like Daniel said, the atmosphere was so, I mean, everyone was so willing to contribute. So as far as I know, there was no need to force anyone, but the ability is there. Uh, you can uh, um, work around the clock uh, and other exemptions from different rules that we usually uh, apply, such, uh, such as annual leave law, work and rest day, etc. So these were, you know, the main things that we are that we faced in terms of legal perspective for the business continuity at the same time um there are some uh protective uh, rights during uh, during the war there are a protective a population protected population that is uh not specific to the war but it's very important to emphasize so first the population of the people who were called up to the military reserve duty. We have a law that doesn't relate to the war specifically that we cannot terminate employees during their military service, during their reserve military service plus 30 days after. I don't, I don't think I should elaborate uh, in this regard, but it is a very, very clear cut, no exceptions. There is a route to go to some uh, committee in the Ministry of Defense, but I don't think I would recommend anyone to go there during uh, the wartime, unless, I don't know, something very extreme happened. Uh, so this is uh, number one. By the way, there are some entitlements to spouses of people who are serving. Uh, they can work uh, less within without a reduction at their compensation. So we have some laws with this regard. Um, we have rights, you know, with respect to uh, uh, parental rights, of course, it doesn't relate to the war, but uh, even in terms of crisis, um, population of pregnant employees, um, employees after uh, maternity or paternity leave and some uh, period after are again protected uh, from termination or different uh, uh, changes in this regard. Again, there is a route of permit, but it's different from the military uh, topic that I mentioned, but still need to be uh, need to be known. 
And the third and the most interesting thing, I think, and this is related directly to the war, uh, the, the declaration of special situation in the home for trigger, the law that was enacted after the Lebanon war, the second Lebanon war in 2006, uh, in which an employer cannot terminate employees who were absent from work due to special instructions from the home front, home front authority, uh, nor if the um, education the, the education system is closed and you are a, a single parent needs to stay with your kids, so you cannot you should you should not and cannot be terminated uh, due to these reasons. Now we have a new amendment to the law. Unfortunately, uh, due to the circumstances, um, there was an amendment to the law that relates to kidnap employees, missing employees, uh, relatives, family members of uh, kidnapped and missing employees that cannot be terminated during the situation. Again, I don't think I should elaborate in this regard. I'm sure that it was if if there was a need to enact this law that maybe something did happen, but still, I don't think you know from my perspective uh, uh, at least, uh, I don't think anyone thought about it. But still, you know, you see some development in the law that is unfortunate due to this unfortunate situation. Um, Daniel, next slide, please. Some additional topics that we dealt with. Uh, I mentioned that the employees cannot be terminated due to the absence from work. This doesn't mean that the employer uh, uh, have is obligated to pay their salaries. So there is no specific provision with, with respect to the payments, which caused some uh, confusion in the market. Many companies and industry did pay the salaries for, for people, for employees who couldn't attend work due to this unfortunate situation. But, you know, there were industries that were badly um, uh, hurted and uh, uh, it was uh, it, it was more difficult and we are all been waiting to uh, uh, the solutions that were expected from, from the government, which leads me to the um, plan, to the framework of compensation for damages that was um, that was presented by the government. Um, just, you know, as a general rule for you to know, uh, we're talking about uh, three routes, green, uh, yellow, or orange, and red. And the red areas, I mean, the red route is to the uh, more uh, zones that were under conflict, you know, the south and the north borders, uh, some specific compensation for direct and indirect damages. As, uh, at, at the same time, the green, uh, the green route is for businesses, uh, places of work, companies in all over Israel, including, for example, Tel Aviv, but the formula is less generous, obviously. There is a cap uh, with respect to uh, revenues that you are being compensated. So many companies are out of this, uh, of this framework. And now we are dealing with filing, uh, with assisting our clients to file uh, when appropriate and uh, fix the requirements under the law. Some uh, claims uh, for uh, the tax authorities, for compensation, uh, for damages, indirect and direct, in accordance with very complicated formula. But you know, you need to know this uh, as well. Uh, leave. Um, there was a special, uh, um, I don't know, framework that we implemented, the government implemented during COVID that was adopted uh, this uh, during this period as well. We call it the unpaid leave route in which because of the fact that many people we do not have what to do you know for example in tourism in the in uh, in the in in, in uh, other fields like this so uh you are you can be uh, forced to take an unpaid leave and get some un, some allowance from the government as if you were terminated but you know you continue the relationship with the employee because it looks like a less aggressive method of course, uh, comparing to termination. Uh, so this is also something that we see in big numbers, okay, the unpaid leave method. Um, also, some uh, uh, good topic that we are, uh, uh, so happy and optimistic topic that we advise with respect to volunteer work, donations, how do we do it, 
And of course, you know, we lawyers always uh, like to uh, add the difficulties, even in good stuff. So, you know, uh, liability, insurance, uh, stuff like that, that needs to be taken care of, even if we want to do something good. Of course, we have to deal with, uh, with the legal uh, results of it. So this was something that we dealt with uh, on an ongoing basis. Last but not least, the social media. I'm sure that you are all know what you, what I'm talking about. Many companies faced um, some uh, uh, social media published by their employees uh, for and against uh, the situation, pro-Israel, pro-Palestine, in particular in multinational companies. Um, it, it, it caused a lot of uh, uh, unrest within you know, the place of work that we have many diverse places of work. And it's needed to be dealt with, you know, in a very sensitive, delicate way. Some some situations were very clear cut. Uh, if it was, you know, supporting terror, supporting the slaughter, etc. Unfortunately, it was very easy to deal with. On the other hand, there were things that were more in the gray area, and there were very um, complicated questions, and not only legal. How do you deal with it? Even if my advice is that you can terminate someone or not terminate someone, what does it mean within the framework of the work? If you have to work together as a team, what would be in the day after? What do you do you know, with all these emotions for both parties in mixed, uh, in mixed workplace? So, you know, this was a real challenge uh, and, and the complicated one, but, you know, the legal aspects are um a challenge that is important but less important from the other challenges but still we are all lawyers so this was you know my brief presentation of what kept us occupied during this uh, uh terrible period and moving uh, back to you uh daniel or yeah um thank you Oli. and uh, this will just to show you a deep dive into one of the more important areas which were it's definitely impacted by the war. But as I said, Oli is extremely busy. My department is extremely busy. The questions are slightly different than they were two months ago. But but we're all back at work, hundreds of lawyers working on a daily basis. And uh, uh, if there's any message I would like to leave you with before I transfer the baton back to Henry, uh, is that uh, we're at work. And if you have business in Israel, we'd be more than happy to give you a service. Uh, if anything, we are faster than we were before the war because we appreciate the work more now than before. So Henry, that's enough from us. Uh, maybe back to you and we'll deal with some questions. Well, thank you, Daniel. And thank you, Oli, uh, for, uh, for that uh, very, uh, very comprehensive and informative um, uh, presentations. Uh, and notwithstanding all of the things that uh, uh, we're reading and speaking about all the time, um, you know, you you were able to uh, to bring um, a, a new and very um, uh, important perspective to all of us. So thank you very much. Um, I, I understand that the two of you have agreed to uh, to take a few questions, and uh, and uh, they're going to come up on the screen. So while you're just processing that, Daniel, maybe I'll just kick off, and then you'll take them off the screen. I I, I just wanted to pick up on something that you said about uh, Saudi Arabia, and it. Um, and the possibility of peace between Israel and Saudi Arabia having precipitated uh, the, uh, the, uh, the, 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 the conflict, the, uh, the, the atrocities on 7 October. Um, from what we can see, Saudi Arabia and their leadership is treading carefully um, in its wartime rhetoric. Uh, they, uh, they're providing some sort of uh, leadership to those countries that have relationships with Israel. Uh, and uh, they seem to be um, uh, presenting uh, some resistance to, to those that don't, specifically Iran. Um, uh, do you believe that normalization uh, is still on the table? And, and do you see talks resuming anytime soon? And, and how will it ultimately be affected by this conflict? So thank you, Henry. L let me start by saying that I am pleasantly surprised by the response of the Arab countries to this war. Historically, every time we entered into a war with the Palestinians, no matter what the, pre, what the context or pretext, all of the Arab countries immediately sided on the part of, on the part of the Palestinians. This is not what has happened here. 
because of the atrocities of October 7th, because Hamas is who they are, and because of their affiliation with Iran and with radical Islam, the Arab countries have adopted for the first time ever a more, I won't say neutral, but, but careful approach. Uh, add to that the fact that the leading Arab country currently involved in this is actually Qatar, which is uniformly hated by all of its neighbors, uh, Saudi Arabia, United Arab Emirates, Bahrain, all of them hate Qatar with a ferocity. So at the end of the day, I currently don't think that this will derail Israeli and Saudi reapproachment, but everyone is waiting to see how this war will end, Henry, because the end picture will impact everything. Uh, the end picture that Israel is looking for is no more Hamas in Gaza. Uh, all the Arab countries support that role, but not publicly, because every one of them would like Hamas to vanish. So my guess is if we succeed in our goal, I, I think that Israeli-Saudi uh, 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 getting closer together is still on the table, but everyone is in a wait to see approach. Thank you, Daniel. That's uh, very encouraging. Yeah. I'm going to let you... Uh... I'm going to let you pick the questions now off okay. the, uh, off the screen, you. please. So I have two questions uh, relating to Francesca Albanese, the UN Special Rapporteur for Palestinian Territories. Uh, and the questions say, she says that Israel doesn't have the right of self-defense because uh, Gaza is not an independent sovereign state. So let me start by saying uh, that she's not alone in this position uh, the International Court of Justice in The Hague, in its infamous 2005 ruling on the fence in the West Bank, also said that they don't think Israel should have the right of self-defense uh, 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 because they claim that the West Bank was occupied and you can't have self-defense against occupied territory. But the reality is that all of these positions belong to a fringe group in international law which happen, all of them, also to be anti-Semitic people. So if you look at any international law book, or if you look even closer uh, at 9-11, uh, you remember that 9-11, the attack against the United States, was, was committed by an organization, not by a state, Al-Qaeda. And, and uh, 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 that didn't stop the UN Security Council uh, all of NATO, and in fact, most of the world, uh, uh, acknowledging that the right of self-defense is, is applicable to the United States. So let me just say that that position is, if a law student of mine in one of my international law classes advocated that position, I would say you're probably letting your politics get in, in front of your law. And I think that is probably true for this UN Special Rapporteur as well. So that's for that. Um, there's a question about, have we had to advise any foreign businesses wanting to leave Israel uh, relating to allegations uh, of, 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 of invested civil society? On the contrary, uh, 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 the current pressure we are under is when can we come back because all of the non-Israelis left on October when the war started, fully understandably. And the reality is they're not coming back in droves because in spite of the fact that the war uh, is has very little impact on Israel proper today, because almost all of the foreign airlines are still not flying to Israel. So except for the Israeli airlines, the only airlines with regular multiple flights a day are actually Etihad and Emirates from the Arab countries and Turkish airlines from Turkey. Uh, uh, and they fly numerous flights every day, but the reality is we're seeing no companies leaving Israel, and many companies saying we want to come back. When can we come back? So it's an interesting development, but we're not seeing the impact of those political pressures on the Israeli economy. Um, the the question here, Henry, which I have no idea what this is about, about an artist called Shabu Dabu which I feel means that someone is singing something that they shouldn't. I, I will say that while Western countries all uh, 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 respect free speech, each country gives a different uh, a definition of what free speech means. Uh, and therefore, that should be dealt with on a national basis. There's no international criteria for any of this stuff. 
So if this is an Australian story, I don't understand <laughs> each in Australia, but I assume uh, Henry and his friends of ABL could answer that easily, I think. Oh, I hope so. Um, do you want to answer that, Henry, or should no, we move go on? No, go on. You keep going. Okay. Um, there's a question here uh, about uh, what do you think the next few years look like and what sort of resolutions are possible? Uh, that's a trillion dollar question. Um, we actually don't know. None of us know. We have a short-term goal, a medium-term goal, and a long-term goal. The short-term goal is to win this war, and by win the war, we really hope to uh, dismantle Hamas as the military power in the South. Can that be achieved? It depends only on two countries, Israel and the United States. No one else can stop us. Uh, 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 and as long as we have U.S. support, we can do it. Uh, the question is, will we get U.S. support to do this? Currently, they're making all the right noises and giving us all the right support. So currently, it looks on the books. Daniel, the um, um, we're, we're sort of coming to the end. Can I just put one other question sure. there? Because uh, we're both looking at the questions and we can see that there's quite a lot of uh, interest in um, in the way in which the government um, is responding. Uh, and, and, and obviously, the functioning of the government before the hostilities was a was a very a very hot topic and uh, uh, continues to permeate uh, through through the situation now with all sorts of uh, all sorts of theories about what will and won't occur. Would you like to proffer some sort of uh, view for us uh, and perspective, please? So the day after, uh, uh, um, there's a lot of work being done and I'm being careful because I'm part of that work, about trying to come up with a vision for the future for our region. Um, as I explained at the beginning of my talk, I spent over 20 years of my life negotiating with Palestinians, uh, uh, including many Palestinians against whom I had taken action in my previous career. Uh, so I, I knew them intimately before I started negotiating with them, and then many of them became friends when we negotiated. Um, I am a strong believer that there are still elements in Palestinian society with whom we can make peace. Uh, the point is that now we need to separate the wheat and the chaff and we need to identify those elements with whom the peace is impossible because they are uh, motivated by religious fervor. And that means that we need to find a process through which Gaza and the West Bank are, are come under the management of what we would call normal people. And that is the end result that the world should be going for, because otherwise, as I think even you felt in Australia, the destabilizing effect of this conflict in the Middle East is global. And this could easily have escalated into an all-out war in the region between Iran, the United States, Israel, and many other countries who have joined in. And this could have been one of those prefaces to a World War Three scenario. Yes. So, so uh, in my eyes, we can only aspire toward a, a resolution in which the Palestinian people can live in, in safety and security under normal management and being normal neighbors and not being the people that the, that the Gazans were in October 7th. That is my Thank you, Daniel. Moment. Thank you, Daniel. Um, unfortunately, uh, it's time to bring the session to a close. And apologies to those... Um, who had questions who we haven't had the time to cover this evening, but uh, possibly uh, either we or, or, or Daniel and Orly are, are able to uh, to do that uh, to do that offline or online. So um, on behalf of us all here at Arnold Block Liebler and all of the attendees, uh, a, a sincere thank you to you, Daniel, Orly, and also to Gil for providing us with this opportunity. Uh, it's turned out to be very insightful and, and, and quite unique and uh, um, um, it certainly uh, improved our understanding of the situation, and I hope uh, uh, through uh, through the airwaves here uh, you can feel uh, the support uh, that we uh, that we we send you uh, for um, for a uh, a successful uh, resolution uh, to this uh, situation. So uh, take care, Kol Tov. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. And thanks to ABL for helping us arrange this.